Welcome to this Jungian life. Three good friends and Jungian analysts, Lisa Marciano, Deborah Stewart, and Joseph Lee, invite you to join them for an intimate and honest conversation that brings a psychological perspective to important issues of the day. I'm Lisa Marciano, and I'm a Jungian analyst in Philadelphia. I'm Joseph Lee, and I'm a Jungian analyst in Virginia Beach, Virginia. I'm Deborah Stewart, a Jungian analyst on Cape Cod. Hello, everybody. Uh, Lisa is not with us right now. She is in Europe at a conference having a great time. So, Deb and I are going to tackle Jung's ideas around Gnosticism which were particularly important to him and validated some of the things that he had been intuiting and observing with his own clients. Gnosticism is a very early response to the Christian mythos. It was a way that several small groups in the Hellenistic period were trying to make sense in a very applied way of how to manage the tension between the suffering of the material world and this idea of a perfected spiritual state. Out of that tension, which all of us, by the way, exist in all the time, came a series of cosmologies, philosophies, and religious practices, and a particular branch of Gnosticism, which is called Valentinian Gnosticism, which Jung was able to find out a little bit more about, really influenced and validated some of his concepts. And we're going to talk about that today. It may sound abstract, but when we break it down into these granular places, it actually is very relevant to the way that our own psychology works. Uh, to uh, add a little bit more to its uh, history and origins, the Levant, all of the area around the uh, Mediterranean, uh, before and then after uh, the birth of uh, Jesus, was really seething with all kinds of ideas and turmoil. Uh, people were unsettled. There was more trade and travel. And uh, so there were all kinds of ideas and needs going on, uh, which one historian says uh, was a feeling overall collectively of alienation uh, from the world that they lived in and people longing for sort of a, a mysterious and miraculous um, salvation. So pessimism about the world um, was combining with attempts at self-transcendence. We might think about whether that has any relevance to today's world. And uh, Gnosticism overall uh, was uh, practiced by all kinds of sects and people and who had different ideas about it in different locations in, in Egypt and what is you know now sort of... Uh, Jordan or Israel, uh, Turkey, etc. And it was the search for a kind of secret, personal, subjective, and transformational kind of knowledge that you could get from your own practice and your own discipline, and you could then achieve your own knowing, uh, not a factual kind of knowing. Um, but but something that would ground you in yourself and the meaning the meaning of your life. So here today we could see uh, some parallels with psychoanalysis, which is uh, one's own quest uh, for an internal uh, kind of knowing. So it's um, really sort of like there... There's nothing new under the sun. Of course, it is new, and it's um, not relegated only to those times way, way, way in the past. Now, some of the dynamics and principles are very much 
relevant today, which is what Jung obviously discovered. I think that one of the ways that we begin to surmise that something is archetypal is that it survives the test of the millennia. Because, for instance, there are innumerable images and ideas that our culture generates. Many of them are stereotypical or cultural icons, but many of those things a thousand years from now will probably be forgotten because they don't necessarily reflect a more universal, primordial truth. One of the things that Jung did, and we all do, is we're looking into antiquity at some of these patterns and ideas that seem to have an uncanny staying power. And that gives us a sense there's got to be something universal to make this stay in consciousness. One of the problems with um, talking about Gnosticism is that when the Catholic Church rose to its tremendous state of political power, that there was a great effort to weed out all other quote unquote competing perceptions. Of Christianity. But initially, the only fragments of Gnosticism were actually found in the Vatican itself, in the commentaries that the um, clergy had written as they were investigating and quote unquote purging the world of Gnostics, Gnostics and Gnostic texts. They were all destroyed. And then, as you were saying, Deb, the treasure trove. Of the Nag Hammadi Library was astounding because it escaped the Great Purgation. That's right. It was um, the 1940s, uh, mid 1940s, and in one case, a you know, ten year process where uh, the Dead Sea Scrolls and the Nag Hammadi manuscripts were uh, discovered, uh, and. That sparked this intense, renewed interest in Gnosticism because we had, you know, texts that had not been been purged, and these were the the Dead Sea Scrolls were uh, came from Jewish traditions written between more or less 300 BCE and 100 BC uh, 100 BC, and um, the Nag Hammadi Scrolls were written in about the 4th century uh, BCE and discovered in 1945, um, one of which uh, the, is the Gospel of um, Thomas, which has been widely read and discussed, which is a Nag Hammadi uh, manuscript. So, um, you know, it this really enabled a resurgence of interest in Gnosticism because we had material. Exactly. So with that incredible resource, um, Jung, Jungians, and of course innumerable other people, began to feel a resonance with some of these ideas. And Jung felt this was really relevant. So I'm going to just, in a very brief way, describe the cosmology of the Valentinian can I pop in with one other yeah, tidbit yeah. of history oh, of before Absolutely. you go there? Absolutely. Okay, because I think it's really interesting. There's a professor named um, Gilles Kispal, who was a historian of religion, and he is the one who, with others, was very interested in and instrumental in uh, publishing the Nag Hammadi manuscripts, especially uh, the Gospel of Thomas. And um, he urged the Jung Foundation to buy something called the 13th Codex, a, a collection of things. He flew to Egypt to buy missing pages. and He knew Jung, and the Jung Foundation did buy it, and I'm sure Jung had great access to it. So that's just another link um, to, to Jung. And with that said, please introduce us to the cosmology. <laughs> so... The first thing that we now know is that there were many different schools of Gnosticism, and this was a kind of spontaneous response to what were very basic stories of the Gospels. As the Gospels were spread around the ancient world, 
it activated this powerful feeling these and these archetypal images. And then, as Jung noted, human beings have a religious function inside of them that we naturally try to wrap these archetypal feelings and images and to relate to them, often in ritualized ways. So, Valentinius uh, was born about 100 AD and died in Alexandria. And he founded a school in Alexandria. And that's important because the great libraries of Alexandria afforded an incredible sharing of knowledge and information. There was an enormous cross pollination of wisdom and information from all over the, at least the conquered world. Egypt was contributing all of the Greek philosophies were mixing in, which created this tremendously fertile environment. So, and for those of you that are scholars, I know that I'm going to be oversimplifying this. But in this model, there is an unknowable divinity that cannot even be imagined. And this divinity gives birth to the only begotten one, or the only begotten son. The only begotten son then produces thoughts, and these thoughts become entities, become kind of universal intelligences, and these thoughts come in cosmic pairs, or syzygies. So there are pairs of opposites that come from the mind of the only begotten. In these pairs of opposites, one of them is Sophia. And Sophia translates into the word wisdom. Sophia's divine partner is Thelatos, which means the longed for or will in its application of longing or reaching for. Now, in the mythology, Sophia becomes full of longing to know the mysterious and unknowable God directly. She doesn't want to have to go through the only begotten one to see some interpreted experience of the absolute divinity. And in her desire to circumvent the natural order of the cosmos, she falls out of balance. She, so to speak, splits away from her partner, Thelatos, and she imagines what the unknowable God should be. And because she is a divine being, her imagined deity takes form, which is called the Demiurge. The Demiurge then begins to create Sophia's fantasies. Sophia imagines what it must be like for the divine to create. But because the demiurge exists in her own imagined form, the demiurge must use the substance of Sophia's own body to create, and for the Gnostics, a perverse approximation of a world. And so the world as we know it in this cosmology is a kind of tortured and misguided fantasy because it is made out of parts of Sophia that there are sparks of Sophia's divinity which are distributed throughout the physical world which don't belong here. In essence, they're trapped in the physical world and that what appears to be the laws of nature are nothing more than a kind of 
perverse and terrible fantasy that was born out of this frustration in Sophia. In some of the Gnostic myths, the idea of the first human being is a kind of worm that over time becomes a human being. So, in, so we're left in that state. We're here in a false world that shouldn't be here. The real world is somewhere in a spiritual realm that we all bear a spark of Sophia inside of us. So there is divinity scattered in all places, but somehow through gnosis, through a revelation that is purely internal, we can discover that this is all a terrible physical mistake and hopefully liberate ourselves from this mistaken world of matter and return with Sophia back to this correct cosmic pairing. So there is a great split. There is a descent into a strange, fantastical misery. But divinity and the truth is somewhere hidden in this. The Gnostic has to break the hypnotic attachment to this false world and discover the spark of Sophia in themselves and hope to restore the Sisji that they belong to Thelatos. And when this is completed, the universe will be restored to its correct status or be redeemed. So there is a great asceticism and a rejection of all of the apparent um, even attractive things about this material world because it was all made by this kind of terrible pseudo god. So let's um, take a step back and um, define what a syzygy is. And then um, I'm liking this idea about that each of us has a little spark of the divine. That's the self. Yeah. Isn't that lovely? Exactly. It, it equates with Jung's idea of the self. Mm -hmm. But you, if we are to go back to Thelatos, is that not in itself a split? Don't Sophia and Thelatos ever combine or, or balance out each other, uh, unite in some way that maintains their individual uh, characteristics? They, there is this problem, right? Because the whole universe <laughs> doesn't fall apart. So the, the clever realization is that there is a higher Sophia and a lower Sophia, that some, act, some aspect of Sophia remains in relationship to Thelatos, and some part of her, Sophia Akamoth, is what they would call oh my it. Goodness. Is the one, it's very complicated, right? Is the one that's removed from the Pleroma, which is the perfect world, and falls downward. So this does get, um, as Winnie the Pooh said, or should have said, <laughs> complicated or uncomplicated or. But it seems to revolve around this idea of opposites. Mm hmm. And um, as everybody's talking about today, binaries. So the world is bad, but you can redeem yourself from the clutches of this, what did you say, hypnotic material world that sort of mesmerizes us into a false idea about what reality is. Exactly. Right? Okay. Um, so let's talk about what all these Gnostic ideas have to do with opposites and Jung's ideas about opposites and syzygy, that world word that I will never, ever learn to spell. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> 
So Jung found this um, idea fascinating. And in Ion, which is volume 9, part 2, when he's talking about the evolution of the image of the self, which often is equated with divinity, he starts with um, animalistic images of the divine and it progresses forward. And so Gnosticism was an important kind of movement in the development of the concept of the self. And what Jung was seeing is that every time that we have a conscious experience or attitude, that it is immediately paired with its opposite somewhere in the unconscious, which is a little bit different from shadow, although it can have some relationship. But this is a really radical idea. So, for instance, every time we fall in love with someone and we're conscious about loving them, its opposite is a nodal point in the unconscious, which could be indifference or perhaps even hatred. Now, we're only conscious of the love part, and that's the Sophia that's fallen into the world. There's only one piece. But somewhere in the unconscious, is the opposite. Now, Jung would say something rather radical, which the Gnostics also believed is, you couldn't feel love if its opposite didn't exist. That there have to be opposites in order for the experience to exist. So it is the tension between love and indifference that actually creates consciousness, and that both are required even though only one might be held consciously. Now, that can seem strange to us, but our dreams will often help us experience this because we talk about compensatory dreams. So I love, 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 love somebody. Oh my goodness, we're perfect, we're divine. And then we have a dream about walking in on, into the bathroom accidentally with our beloved on a toilet and we're disgusted, which is like not at all what you're thinking <laughs> about consciously. But the opposite is being offered because in terms of psychological hygiene, both of these things need to be held in order for us to not be in a state of splitting. Mm -hmm. it, it's really um, very interesting that the um, compensatory function in Gnosticism, as I'm uh, just at the edge of learning, was the spark of divine of the divine is within each one of us, as compensatory to various forms of organized religion. You know, in a time when there was huge diversity and change. Um, so don't don't worry if the outer world structures aren't all unified and stable. You you've got what you, what you need of the divine within you. And in individual psychology, when you're madly in love with someone, the compensatory function puts that little spark of. That person is also really irritating <laughs> inside us. Uh, so that instead of a split, there's hopefully a balance. That, that if we can acknowledge the dream where, to our shock and dismay, uh, we saw our beloved sitting on a toilet, if, if we can take what that means, what that symbolizes, of uh, the shattering of an illusion and idealization uh, and integrate that, then it will save us, hopefully, from just that little part of splitting, that my beloved is all good and all wonderful. Um, that no, it's both. A and Jung was... I would say it was so core to his theories and work 
is that there is, sh is light and shadow. There's love and disgust, irritation, hatred, indifference, a whole list. Uh, so that we don't fall into those uh, splits of all one thing and nothing of the other. So one of the talking about this tension between organized religion, such like Catholicism versus Gnosticism, is something that Jung actually writes about. Murray Stein does an, an incredible job with this. The collected works of Murray Stein are being published. I recommend them very highly. He's, he's such an incredible apologist for Jung's work and makes it come to life. So Murray writes about Jung and Christianity, and he's scoured Jung's work to try to put together a cogent sense of what Jung was trying to reach for, which is scattered among many different places in his writings and in his struggles with his friend Victor White, who was a priest, and, and the great tension between them. But Jung has a sense that religion is changing which goes to the Max Zeller dream that you have uh, mentioned many oh times, Deborah, <laughs> that um, there is the ancient idea of the Catholic Church, or the Church as an institution, which is not simply Catholicism, by the way, and that that served a purpose. And Jung also um, had a good time with astrology. He talked about the age of Pisces which is the age of the fish, and the fish was also a symbol of Christ, and that human beings did in fact benefit from all of this structural assistance, even benefited from the enormous amount of rules that were imposed upon them, because rules force us to be conscious. When we think about the book of Leviticus, or even the Talmud, let's say, there are, there are rules for, for every little thing. Now, whether or not that pleases God, I don't know, but for a stage of evolution in human consciousness going from being very instinctive to paying attention and making conscious choices about every little thing helped the growth of ego strength, the growth of consciousness. But Jung said that this is this is ended, this this in in this next eon, human beings are going to outgrow this idea of being told and being given doctrinal things and repeating rituals as a way of imagining that we're having spiritual experiences. And uh, uh, just in this moment, because this is related to Gnosticism, um, can you tell that story of the uh, Max Zeller dream? Because it's really relevant. Yeah, I was just going to go back there. And, yeah, yeah. Uh, because um, not everybody will know about it. And it, it is a wonderful image. Uh, Jung had um, a patient uh, named Max Zeller sometime uh, right after World War II. And um, Max Zeller was a psychoanalyst um, in California who went to see Jung because of uh, being disturbed by the state of the world, which was right after World War II, was distressing for all kinds of, of very big, big reasons. And um, like a lot of us, I, I'm, this has happened to me, uh, he had a dream and he was about to leave Switzerland. And then he realized that he had forgotten to tell Jung his dream. And he, so he called him up. And said, oh my gosh, I was there yesterday and I forgot to tell you this dream. I can't believe it. And Jung said, come right over. And uh, so the dream that Max Zeller had was that uh, he was uh, watching a vast temple being built. And it went on for as far as the eye could see. The foundation had been built, the first floor was there, and everywhere people were working on building uh, columns. And each person is working on building his or her own column. 
And uh, Jung said, you know, yeah, he said, this is a dream people all around the world are having, people you don't know in Russia and India and everywhere. And he said it was a dream of the new religion, um, by which he did not mean a doctrinally organized uh, belief system. But, um, you know, I have loved this dream because it's such a great way of integrating uh, the opposites that we've been talking about, of individual development, or what Jung called individuation, what the Gnostics um, imaged as the spark of the divine, um, with a, a communal or collective uh, endeavor. So everyone builds their individual pillar. And it is part of a vast temple. So it's a wonderful image of a both our individual selves and creative energy as part of a greater whole. Hello, listeners. We are really excited to invite you to a live podcast recording to celebrate the publication of our new book, Dreamwise Unlocking the Meaning of Your Dreams. The event will be held on November 17th at 1 p.m. Eastern, and there's going to be a lot of fun stuff. We'll let our hair down with you. You can laugh along with us as we roll with bloopers in front of the live cameras. And a lucky few of you will walk away with the Dream Alchemist Toolkit. We really want you to join us in this mission of awakening people to their inner wisdom. And, and when you think of buying your copy of DreamWise, Think about the people you could share that with and introduce them to a similar moment when you realize what your dreams really could mean. At the live event, we're going to be interpreting a lot of your dreams. It'll be kind of like a dream a thon. We're going to ask that you submit your dreams at the event. So come prepared. We'll be sharing a link and then we'll be interpreting those dreams as we get them. So we hope you'll join us. Tickets are in the link. And we'll see you on the 17th. And Murray really pulled together from various sources what Jung was imagining that this new religion would look like. And what he had a sense is that people would be liberated from these doctrinal rigid ideas, that they would gain access to the deeper parts of their own psyche to the self, that in their fantasies and dreams, that they would self-produce images and symbols that actually help them to individually connect to the self, rather than assigned symbols from an organization. And that this would give them a true sense of their connection to the divine. That would be a kind of gnosis and internal wisdom and knowing that would link them to this transpersonal center, and that through collective sharing of dreams of this nature, that we as a community of humans would generate and share the various images that connect the individual to the transpersonal. And that would be the new way, or something like that, the new way that human beings would forge this relationship. And so now we can understand how Jung then brought this into a therapeutic goal, a psychotherapeutic goal, and said, the restoration of the ego self-access is the great work of Jungian analysis and is unique and different from other kinds of psychotherapy. That our task is to discover the image-making function inside of us, to be able to clear out the complexes that are confusing us, and to begin to discover the images and symbols that are generated by the relationship between the ego and the self and to, through that, have our own kind of personal mythology that works and is 
active in facilitating this relationship to the deeper parts of us. The language may sound very exalted, but in a practical sense, this is what your day-to-day dreams are trying to do. Your, your every morning dreams are trying to nudge you into this, into this place. And so the Gnostics, or at least the goal of the Gnostics for Jung, just rang true as absolutely this is, this is the, the individuated story of, of religion, where it can only happen inside of you, and that the Gnostic sects were experimenting with ways they thought could facilitate that. There's no way for us to know um, through the Nakamadi um, fragments whether or not it was or wasn't effective at that time. But the goal and the images, that made sense. And we are still trying to find a secret spark inside of things. And Jung saw that resurgence of that task in alchemy. Okay. And that alchemy kind of bridged uh, the Gnostic tradition with for Jung, the psychoanalytic process, that the alchemical images were images generated uh, materially by the alchemists who took them literally in a pre-chemistry time, but which were really um, the alchemists' projections onto matter and that those are the processes of the unconscious, of heating things and melting things. And um, you're a resident alchemist, so you you can say much more about this than I can. Well, but the, the, the assumption is that even in the basest of things, let's say lead, which is the cheapest, most common, even poisonous um, metal, but there is some secret in it which can reveal that it can be gold, that it can be the most precious thing. They also were fascinated with um, theses, which is the vilest of things. And so in the vile thing is somehow the most precious thing. And Heraclitus and the fragments of Heraclitus, who was an ancient Greek philosopher, had this also wonderful idea. And he said, you know, if, if one situation, if one quality goes to its furthest extreme, it will suddenly become its opposite. So there is something inside of us that's archetypal, which he felt was being um, language in the mythology of the Gnostics and also the projections of the alchemists, that's a truth about our structure as human beings. That even it, uh, although the Gnostics um, denied or reviled the material world, there is nonetheless that spark of the divine. And in the lead, which is, you know, can be poisonous and heavy and thick, or feces, which is vile that there was something redeeming, a potential for something else. Uh, And I think this idea of the opposites is so central uh, to Jung's uh, work and conceptual framework uh, that it's very seldom just one thing that and don't we have a hard time holding on to that? Uh, you know, the people that we just can't stand, whatever group they are, they're out there somewhere. Yes. They're all the lead, they're all the darkness, and we're all the good stuff. And uh, that, like the alchemists who patiently with their bellows and their fires and whatever else Uh, worked at transforming and discovering the inner gold. 
you know, the, there we we are that we can't just split things into good, bad, right, wrong, uh, and, and those kinds of those kinds of things. Uh, somewhere there's there's gold to be found. And even in the Sophia myth, that because Sophia splits, then she is living in a world that is a kind of illusion, which is exactly how how we are, which which is the coordination, you know, humans created the mythology, that when we are split inside of ourselves, we create these kind of neurotic, fantastical interpretations of the world that are not often true or realistic. And everything gets very muddied. There is a spark of, of truth in everything, but it can become so covered and smeared and messed up by the fleeing from the parts of reality that we find frightening or distasteful. And in that way, we're kind of lost. You know, I want to um, take a step into something else here, because um, I think it's really fascinating to explore, and that is uh, the image of the serpent. Sethian Gnosticism. Okay. Yeah. But, <laughs> okay. <laughs> Good well, stuff. Uh, let her rip after um, I throw you one more nugget here, which is uh, that in one version of uh, Gnostic cosmology, is that the serpent actually befriended Adam and Eve by saying, you know, come on over, have a taste of this. You know, the Lord says you shouldn't do it, but he's just trying to prevent you from knowing more. And you're actually entitled to know more. So uh, at any rate, the serpent as having empowered Adam and Eve. And so say some more about this. <laughs> well, in, in Sethian Gnosticism, Adam and Eve had a third son named Seth. And Seth preserves the lineage of spiritual um, knowledge. And part of that knowledge is this struggle you know, for consciousness, this struggle for light. And in that particular Gnostic sect, the symbol of the serpent, just as you were saying, becomes a symbol of wisdom. Now. Um, there's a great story that someone had told me many years ago that as Jung and the other early analysts were forming the Zurich Institute, they began to notice that many of the candidates fairly early on would have dreams of being bitten by serpents. And it became so ubiquitous that people were troubled if they didn't get a dream of being <laughs> bitten by a serpent. That was like, that was an essential ingredient. And at some point, apparently, the, some of the analysts wanted Jung to comment on that. And he said, yes, 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 of course. Because a correct analytic interpretation bites the ego. At first, it feels poisonous, and it makes the ego feel unwell. But it is the poison of wisdom. And once that wisdom is integrated into the ego, it is revived and exists in a higher and better functioning. So it is the serpent that, yes, it does hurt. And, and sometimes analysts need to speak unspeakable things to the client because so much is split off, which is, brings us back to the splitting. Often what's spoken is the thing that I don't want to hear. So it's a wonderful example um, in this framework for today of Gnosticism and opposites and Jung's work of here is a symbol, an image that bridges those gaps. Uh, it's the worst, most awful, fearsome, bad, unquote, unquote, thing. And 
it has that gold in it of wisdom and knowledge and, and psychological growth. Wisdom. Yeah. And serpents used to um, be part of the temples of Asclepius, uh, the god of healing. Who, there were dreamatoriums. Uh, 250 or so all around the Mediterranean. And these were non-poisonous snakes, but they were part of the temple. They were part of Cretan religion. They've been part of uh, Christianity's sects of, uh, can't say much about it, but we keep going to snake, 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 it, perhaps in order to reconcile these opposites. So coming full circle, we often talk about the snakes are associated with wisdom, but the Greek word for wisdom is Sophia. So if the venom of the snake is wisdom that at first makes you feel unwell, but then actually liberates you, that the snake is the earthly Sophia. She is the Sophia that is moving, slithering in holes in the ground, that she is alive and, and is unrecognized and even reviled by the false world. That the demiurge is the purely materialistic, literalistic attitude. That what the demiurge has created and said, this is, this is the divine, it's actions, all of this world of suffering and problems. But moving around underneath the leaves, underneath the ground, is a spark of Sophia. And that if we encounter her, she is uncanny. If she bites us and a little bit of Sophia gets into us, puts us at great odds to the world that we thought we were living in, and the dangerous Art comes is that we realize there's something else totally <laughs> different that's going on inside of me and perhaps inside of the world. So that a tremendous ambivalence that we have towards wisdom. What I am thinking of now is uh, the thread that runs through this. From time immemorial, people going to the temples of Asclepius, people in these Gnostic sects out there in the desert, and psychoanalysis, of it doesn't get downloaded to you. You have to go looking for it. You have to make the effort. People walked and walked and traveled to get to one of these healing temples. People come every week, more or less, uh, for psychoanalytic work. The, the power resides in us to seek it. And I think that is um, heartening and, tr and true, um, that it doesn't have to just descend on you from, from the outside. Uh, if you're lucky. <laughs> like the serpent, it comes out of the ground. It comes it's right by your foot, you know, and nips you, um, and you're like, oh, my gosh. I didn't want to know that. And by the way, this, this is one of the tremendous crises of our time right now, is that we have created these information systems around us that we call them echo chambers. So if I believe something, I can find environments that just reinforce whatever demiurge self-creation is out there, and that facts now become dangerous. And so we once had an administration that said, no one in the federal government is permitted to ever use the word climate change, that that is, that is not permitted in any federal agency. That was previous uh, president had set that as a presidential order. Um, so saying climate 
change is like the bite of the serpent. The fact that the climate may be changing is could be very upsetting. It's frightening. We don't. I don't want to know this. I don't want to be upset. So don't bite me with the facts. So let's let's banish whatever it is that we don't like, and pretend it doesn't exist, or pretend we can squash it in one way or another. But sooner or later, the serpent of wisdom is going to give us a nip, and. The world actually hasn't changed in any way, but we then know something that we had been refusing to know. Wouldn't that be nice of to just um, not have to know stuff and to have the external world uh, be harmonious, uh, be consistent with our beliefs? provide us with the kind of stability and security and happily ever after, if only you do this, 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 and this. That would be really, really great. And the awful truth, as ever, you know, as Adam and Eve discovered, you've got to make your way in a harder Harder world. You have to learn how to farm and go to the well to get water and and give it a go. And for the Gnostics, um, you have a spark of the divine, and that that will help you become your best, most realistic, and empowered self. And when the snakes of life bite us. The question is, what do we do with that? What do we do with that? Can we call it wisdom? Wisdom that makes us feel unwell. Can we use it? And to um, really literalize this, uh, the way that people who work with uh, snakes uh, become immune to snake bite is by titrating their venom and um, injecting tiny amounts and then increasing those amounts over time. And I think that, in a way, is a great image for life. We're, we're going to be bitten. And, um, you know, how can we uh, surmount it and, and not be so vulnerable to it? Uh, because here we are on this earth the way that it is and we're we're able if we apply ourselves I, I love the images of these gnostic sects out in the desert you know per, have with all these ascetic practices around you know food and ritual and all the rest of it of uh, you know they worked at it um i, I personally don't want to go into the desert and uh eat that way but there are lots of ways to work on our own becoming and our own growing and strengthening. That is absolutely true. You know, from the Gnostic standpoint, because you'd brought up Eden, Eden rather, that Eden was created by the Demiurge, and that Adam and Eve were human beings who were hypnotized into thinking the world that the Demiurge had created was the real world. And everything is great and fine and I'm sleepy and um, the senses and the animal instincts are just are doing just perfectly well. And then the serpent, the serpent of wisdom, bites us and then we can discern um, good from evil. And for the Gnostics, the realization is, wait a minute, this world of pain and suffering is the evil place, that the good thing is in the true, spiritual, real world, and that I have been asleep, and that once we awaken from this hypnosis of thinking that this world is the only world, then we understand that we have to labor labor in this world, but also labor to try to find our way back 
or find our way to a much higher perception of who we are and what the world is, which our senses cannot report to us. That, that the imagination inspired by something deep inside of us tells us that what our eyes see is an incomplete picture. And the thing that's added to what our eyes see is meaning. That what the self provides through its symbolic illuminations of your life are levels of meaning that your eyes can't see but are in fact there. I think I would also um, like to put in a plug <laughs> for this material world that is precious and beautiful and harsh, tragic, and here we are. And so it's up to us also to bridge that gap uh, between a consciousness and an awareness um, and a kind of eros and the bodies that we live in and the things that we have to do to get through the day, the week, the year. Um, th this is it. Everything we do, we do with ourselves. Uh, from from cooking dinner to meditating to reading to loving a child. Uh, and we can make the most of it. We hope. <laughs> well, I think that Jung's idea that human beings are essential and that we bring a level of consciousness that our bodies know how to live in this world and that we have instincts that help us organize to the beauty and the terrors of the world. But it's our consciousness that allows us to turn our instinctive impulses into a form of art. That's why cooking just feeds your body, but it's consciousness that turns it into the art of gourmet combinations of things the art of creating housing, the art of clothing our bodies, that it's a human imagination that adds beauty and improvements to things that our instincts would have given us only a rudimentary experience of. So where in um, Gnostic cosmology is Eros, is love, empathy, beauty, appreciation for all those kinds of things that we we just have skirted it, but we haven't landed right on that square, and I'd like to. I think that um, in Valentinian Gnosticism, that everything that was associated with the physical world was thought of as a stumbling block, that there is a, an extraordinary asceticism, and so one did not seek or beauty in the physical world, or even goodness in the physical world, that it was found in the imaginal world. It was found in exclusively in the internal world. I have to say, though, that m much of our feeling about the beauty of the world is afforded to us because in modernity, the world doesn't affect us as negatively as it did in the ancient world. I mean, 2,000 years ago, most of us were fighting to not starve, that, that we were seeing maybe 80% of our babies pass away, or women passing away in, during labor, that, that the physical life was very, very difficult and painful, a disease went unchecked, etc., etc., we live in an age, at least in America, where we can afford to see the physical world in its beautiful and tamed aspects 
that is subject to the remarkable capacity to shape our surroundings in so many ways. But in the more ancient world, nature was red in tooth and claw, in that the physical world was mostly really hard and really difficult and really painful. And so thinking there's got to be someplace better than this, I think was the common lot for most people. So it's interesting. Um, I'm building on what you're saying, extending it. So edit this if it needs to be, that you're saying, I think, that back in those times, denying the importance or the meaning of the material world was compensatory to finding meaning in the, in the realm within and the imaginal and spiritual realm. But I wonder if today we need to go in a way back the other way because things have gotten out of balance and we are so divorced from the natural world and spend so much time on electronic devices and work cubicles and you know all the other um, accoutrements of modern life uh, that we've lost the connection uh, with instinct, with nature. Um, and with those grounding realities that um, electric lights and heated rooms and television screens can't give us. And I think you're absolutely right that Jung was not advocating for some remarkable ascetic spirituality. And in fact, the early Catholic Church take took on much of that asceticism that the Gnostics had, the demonization of sexuality, the veneration of poverty. So, so we see in the early organizations that they were definitely influenced in this dualistic thinking, that spirit and matter cannot be resolved. So you are advocating for exactly the the attitude that is able to combine spirit and matter in a symbolic attitude which allows both to be undiminished and yet for there to be a new attitude. And I think this is what the alchemists were offering, which is there is a secret in matter. There's, there is something beautiful in matter. And, and they would project the anima mundi which is this divine, exquisite divine feminine that it moves like an orchestral reality through all of nature. This, this great ensoulment of nature with something that is beautiful and remarkable and, and worthy to be sought out. And so, in a way, uh, the beat goes on. <laughs> right? We're still there. Uh, of relating um, materiality and spirituality, or relating consciousness and the unconscious. How do we deal with the opposites? What are our dreams telling us? Uh, that it's a continual process uh, of, of balancing, integrating, discriminating, we're, we're in a dance with ourselves, with each other, with the world. And we are caught between choices all the time, and perhaps more so in the modern world than ever, because we have more options than we ever had. I'll quickly tell a dream, which brings us down to a very earthy level. All of this mystical opposites really is right in your living room, like every day. I once had an in Alisand who was um, a very refined European, very, very smart, very, very educated. And she was um, a, a professor, and she was residing in a small home near the university, and, and that was very much her life. Even though it was in the United States, the style, her lifestyle was very much like a European professorial relationship. And, 
in Europe, the professors would actually live on the campus. Uh, they would come into the dining hall in a row, you know, and have breakfast with everyone. That was their whole life. And so there were, there were qualities of that. But she began to have a, a powerful yearning and fantasy to actually purchase a place outside of town with acreage and to own horses. So this other vision of a bucolic life, of a life connected to nature, which is just what you were saying, Deb, kept happening. And, and in her, we might not understand it, but it seemed like an irreconcilable tension that she could only have one or the other, but psychologically could not find a way to, to live in both of those worlds. She also was a music professor. That's important in the, the resolution. So this tension of, should I go and buy this place? No, 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 I have to stay here in town near the university and back and forth and back and forth. It was, it was a mysterious agony for me because part of me thought, buy the place in the country, commute to the university. Yeah. But the psyche uh, do was, both, right? Yes. Just do both. <laughs> Don't we do that a lot? <laughs> but this, her psyche said, was demanding something more profound. So she has this dream. She's sitting on a porch in this country home. And she looks up and there is a wind chime above her. And as the wind blows, it plays symphonic music. And she woke up from that dream and suddenly she felt like she could move to the country. And, and rather quickly she found everything and created what she wanted within the year. So for whatever reason, there was this split in the psyche. But the wind chime, which is activated by something as natural as a breeze, still plays symphonic music so that both nature and whatever um, classical music meant to her or her role in that world, they actually could both live together in that transcendent symbol of the symphonic wind chime. So that's a, a pair of opposites, which for this person was an irreconcilable tension. The transcendent function provides a symbol that resolves the tension. And in the great scheme of the Gnostics, the irreconcilable, terrible earth and the glorified spirit of God is reconciled in the mythopoetic story of Jesus, who is both a material human being and God who reconciles the two worlds, the two universes of matter and spirit. And one might say, from a purely psychological standpoint, that the human psyche creates the symbol, the image of the Redeemer, in order to resolve the excruciating Gnostic tension, where the only solution was just escape. That's a lovely dream and uh, a wonderful uh, symbol and image of how that heals. They're just wind chimes. They get, you know, the wind blows and they play symphonic music uh so um this is what we this is what we hope for what we work toward is is that third thing that reconciles the tension and the and the opposites so that it's not materiality or spirituality you know good or bad strong or weak but uh somehow all that's right. So the, so the Syzygy now lives together, that whatever the nature is, let's say, and the urban experience of being a music professor, now are restored. Now they are a couple, and there's, they're not split off, and they get to live together in the pleroma, you know, in the fullness of the greater universe. So as Jean-Luc Picard from Star Trek used to say, let it be so. Let it be so, <laughs> absolutely. 
the great adventure. Let us uh, step out of these Gnostic depths and um, move on and into a dream. Before we do that, I would like to just say briefly our um, new book on dream interpretation. Oh, dream we have a Wise. Book? We do. Dream Wise is available for pre order on um, Amazon and many other different platforms where you can find your book. And so you can join us in enhancing your own uh, jump into dream interpretation. And take a look online at our new website, uh, dreamwisebook.com, and come join us for our dreamography project and uh, learn a little more about the book and just explore. Jump in the water with us. <laughs> come on in. <laughs> So today's dreamer is a 58-year-old female who is a business and life coach. And she offers us this dream. I'm floating in a lake. I'm not far from shore, but I'm in deep enough water that I'm unable to touch the bottom of the lake. The water is black, but not menacing. I am naked, floating on my back. The sun is shining above like a beautiful summer day. I notice that I have a black seat belt wrapped around my waist. It is not only fastened, but knotted. I'm holding two babies. I would guess to be approximately nine months old. They are boys. I realize they too have black seat belts fastened and knotted around their waists and their seat belt straps are knotted to my seat belt around my waist. The baby seat belts are approximately two feet in length. I'm floating comfortably, as all is going well with each baby tucked in the crook of my armpits with their heads resting on each side of my shoulders. I believe all is going well, but I realize I may not be able to float forever. I begin to feel unease, and one of the babies squirms. In order to reposition the squirming baby, the other baby must be let go, and he sinks below the water. I then help the submerged baby to the surface, who is now choking on water. But this upsets the balance, and the other baby dips below water. I'm caught in a balancing act of trying to maintain my balance while keeping the two babies calm and with their heads above water. I also must pat each choking baby on the back in an upright position to clear the fluid they've swallowed. This further exacerbates the situation, and the alternating sinking situation happens more frequently. At the same time, I'm also trying to untie the knots in the seat belts as I feel the babies would be better off if not connected to me. This back-and-forth struggle continues for some time until I awaken. For context, she tells us, I recently lost my 29-year-old son to overdose. He's had a serious addiction for 10 years. Nine years ago, I lost my only other son when he was 17 to an accidental overdose. The main feelings in the dream, she writes, I feel calm at the beginning of the dream, all is well, and I'm comfortable. I'm confident in my ability to float. I become more and more anxious as the dream progresses to the point I am frantic about saving the babies. I'm frustrated at not being able to undo the seat belts or untie the knots. And she adds, I believe the lake I am in is the lake that our family has a cottage on. I've always been a strong swimmer and an excellent floater. I'm very confident in the water, and am very attached to water. The babies in my dream are not my sons. I feel no more connection to them beyond the need to save them. I'd been thinking about seatbelts the other day. 
as I have a seatbelt for my dog when she's in the car. I stopped using it for several months, but found it and thought I should be using it regularly. These are intense images. Um, I think what I, where I want to begin is with my own reaction uh, to starting with the dream and then the loss of her two adult sons. And the reason that I report that out is that uh, it's Im important to pay attention to feeling because what arises in you or me or any of us in hearing a dream or hearing a story uh, is very likely part of the larger field. And uh This is, these are huge life events. And uh, contrasted with her not having any particular attachment to either of the dream babies, uh, other than, you know, making uh, conscientious efforts to uh, keep everyone literally in the dream afloat. It goes from, I'm playing with the image of floating. And I, I think most of us have had that experience of uh, the, the ego is given kind of a time out while you're floating, usually with your eyes closed in this sort of oceanic experience, even if it's a lake of just you let go. There's nothing really to do. Um, but we don't float for a really long period of time because all of a sudden we wonder, like, okay, where am I? <laughs> am I uh, time to come back uh, to consciousness or more consciousness? The water is black but not menacing, and the sun is shining. So it's everything starts out in this lovely uh, c kind of mood and relationship of our material body to water, which is often the unconscious. And then we have the, the seat belts and two babies, and they have seat belts. And um, things really uh, get much, much more, more anxious in this kind of mission impossible scenario that the dream maker uh, presents. Back and forth struggle continues for some time. And that's the story of the dream. Back and forth struggle to keep new life alive with black seat belts that are useless and encumbrances in the water. What are you thinking, Joseph? My first, um, my first attitude is that it would be easy to say, oh, this is a dream about her two sons. But the dream is often saying something that we don't know. So to say that, oh, this is a mom trying to keep her two sons safe, well, but she knows that, and she's lived that, so that's... So, so it's difficult sometimes to not get seduced by the by her life context and to say, okay, symbolically, rather than literally, she's floating on a black lake and it's rather beautiful. And I think you were inferring, Deb, that there's something kind of blissful about floating in a kind of almost uterine regression nothing to do, it's easy, there's really no effort. And as she is 
in this uterine environment, images of babies start to populate in the psyche that are tethered to her because she herself is in the arms of the great mother and the great mother who is mysterious, thus the water is black and warm, that it's unfathomable. Um, and yes, it does evoke these baby energies. And in the beginning, everything is okay. So I ask myself, where do things go south? Where do things suddenly become a problem? She believes all is going well, and it is going well, but then she has a thought. I may not be able to float forever. So what happens is she becomes anxious, and she begins to impose something into the situation. And once she begins to frighten herself, then there's a squirming energy. And then she, and this is the thing that's odd in the dream, I'm uneasy, I'm uneasy, a baby squirms. And the response is, well, just let go of the other baby and let it fall into the water, and I'll just re I'll handle the squirmy one. That's a very extraordinary decision to make, if that was the real life, to just totally let go of it rather than just let them both squirm a little bit on your shoulders. I mean, that would seem like a better solution. But once this um, unease begins to happen, not just in her, but with all the babies, she's kind of a baby too, all three of the babies become uneasy. And then it's a struggle to keep consciousness here. Because for something to fall under the water is to slip away from consciousness. They are tethered to her. Can you imagine what would happen if she was successful at untying the seatbelt? Then the babies would just slip out of her hands. Yeah, their seat belts are knotted to my seat belt right. around my waist. So once they slip under the water, that so seat belt. So they're tethered to one another. Right. Yeah. But the part of her that wonders maybe it would be better if I took off the seat belt, which then means that the infants could, and maybe they should for all I know, rest back into the unconscious. And so at that point, she may be able to return to her own adult position, which is she's very capable at navigating waters. She's not a baby. She knows what to do. She can swim to shore. She's a good floater. She knows what to do. But when the infantile part of her gets too close to her, then it's confusing. Priorities are confusing. Things are uneasy. This is unsustainable. I'm too vulnerable. I, I couldn't float forever, and I become anxious. And that is what happens when the young parts of us take us over. We're in a moment where we are competent, but all of a sudden the inner infant disrupts the ego's ability to do what it knows to do, and all of a sudden it can't quite function correctly. What do you think, Deb? What's What are you indexing on here? Um, all is well in the dream, as long as uh, the dream ego is just floating mm -hmm. in, you know, the sort of blissful, uroboric, oceanic state of not having to pay attention. There's nothing that has to be done. Uh, everybody's peaceful. But but then, as ever, uh, this is a state that cannot be permanent. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, the tethers are, are seat belts. Seat belts are car equipment. Mm -hmm. And she references that in her comments about she's got a, a seat belt for her dog. So cars are very much ego functions. They go where we 
uh, drive them. Um, we're in charge. And I wonder if this is a dream about um, all being well as long as the dream ego can float. Mm -hmm. But uh, as soon as babies start wriggling and the water gets cold and, and all the rest of it, uh, in this necessarily impermanent state, um, then the anxiety uh, comes up. Then um, it's it's a difficult, almost impossible uh, situation, a and that she feels she untying the knots in the seat belts uh, would be better for the babies be better if they weren't connected to her. Mm -hmm. And because she mentions the loss of her two sons, I'm wondering if the, the process that we all have in losing people we love is still going on, of how to resolve this loss of being tied to them wanting to untie there are knots uh, in the seat belts and psyche is speaking to this so if we take even the play of words with mm -hmm. your interpretation the knot is the not letting go mm. the no the knot and so in service to what you were saying is, yeah, maybe well, she thinks the babies would be better off if she were to let go and then become her own independent person. She's already deconfected from feeling. She wakes up and she doesn't really have much feeling for the babies. Perhaps that is the beginning of a capacity to let go because it she was overwhelmed with feeling the concept would be one couldn't even imagine the process of letting go, so the feelings have to be quieted a bit. Uh, I also think that um, the baby who come who resurfaces is choking on water. That I was also thinking about the way we can choke on emotion. That when we get very emotional, it's like we can't even speak. It, it hits the throat in a particular way. So trying to keep from being choked on the ocean of grief that she is floating on, and the ocean of sorrow that she may be floating on. And I may not be able to float forever, that it may be that I will descend into this black ocean of grief. And one She's trying to for that not to happen. Mm -hmm. I'm not suggesting that she should necessarily drown in notion of grief either. She has to relate to it, um, not not suffocate in it. So I can understand the the challenge of how to orient to the situation she is in. Yeah, I think. Um I think we're very much, you know, on either similar or the same kind of page, that this is a dream that depicts the situation, that says, here's the situation. And there is, as yet, no lysis, no, no real outcome of then what happens. Uh, that somebody sees this and comes out uh, in a rowboat uh, and says, get in, or you discover that you you can touch bottom and start to walk ashore. Uh, we could imagine lots of outcomes that we would wish for. But I think the stream says just exactly what she writes. 
This back and forth struggle continues for some time until I awaken from the dream, and that this process is a huge process. It, it is a struggle, a back and forth struggle. And that psyche is validating how difficult this is. So if, if we take that and that the difficulty is unease mm -hmm. and that it's this, it's the way that she interprets the dis-ease and the squirming of the babies that then sets off this mm -hmm. kind of swinging of the balance kind of back and forth. Mm -hmm. If she could tolerate the dis-ease, if the baby was just allowed to squirm as it rested against her armpit, then she could be able to float in, in that world. Mm -hmm. But and, and she is seeking to restore ease, by the way. I may not be able to float. That makes me uneasy, and I want to feel ease again. Mm -hmm. So she is struggling against the uneasiness of her situation, and then that sets in motion this tilting back and forth. But maybe ease isn't the only thing to shoot for in this situation. Yeah, I, I think you really um, uh, understanding something important here, that the dream ego becomes agitated, mm -hmm. which makes you know all kinds of sense as all of us and everyone who's listening Sure. We'll go, oh my gosh, you know, what are you going to do? How do you balance this? What do you do? But yes, but the baby's squirming. And, mm -hmm. and maybe what you're uh, pointing to is how not to become so frantic in this kind of really difficult mission impossible situation that the dream ego perhaps like the waking ego, wants to manage it. And it's beyond ego's capability. And it is awful. Um, but the frantic efforts aren't actually effective. Right. And that making the babies comfortable in that situation is actually not the most important thing. <laughs> Most important thing is to stay afloat. Yeah. And that is really quite powerful advice for any of us that have had an enormous loss is I just need to stay afloat. I mean, there are these terrible, painful, excruciating, awful things that have happened. Can I just stay afloat? Uh, which is you know, often a metaphor for just basic functionality. And, and the implication is... Um, I'm speaking, you know, like the dream ego, you know, I have to save them. I have to make this work. I have to find a way. Yeah. But the radical acceptance is, what if I can't? Mm -hmm. what, what if I really can't? What if this is not a function that ego can provide? That I can, I can save them. I, I, I can make it. Uh, you know, if we really imagined this, of out in black water, feet don't touch the bottom, uh, no rescue is forthcoming, what if you can't? And, and the other interesting and odd thing is, I'm floating in a lake and I'm not far from shore, mm. and the impulse to just hold the babies tight, do a little scissor kick on your back and start <laughs> heading to shore because the babies are a little squirmy, they're not enjoying it. 
-hmm. But um, from the dream ego's position, that she can't um, can't conceive of that at the moment. But it is interesting that something inside of the dream ego can't imagine getting to shore. Um, so that's curious. Nine months, I think, is also important. Um, mm, sometimes yeah. when there's such a specific timeline, maybe we would go back nine months and look at, did you give birth to something? Um, could be that the babies represent two important creative projects that you've been working on. Maybe nine months ago you started writing a book and you started a new job. And then very recently this terrible tragedy happened with the death of your son and you just can't can't manage yeah. to keep alive these two creative potentials. I just can't keep writing the book and I can't keep the new job. I I can't I can't stay afloat and keep all of these creative the or at least these two creative potentials, creative projects, creative ideas. Uh in, in my hands. And that's very normal when you have a tragedy like that. So you may need to let go about of some of these baby projects. Um, but also understand that this is that this is metaphoric. So it maybe you'll let go of the, the book project as a baby, but it doesn't mean that it can't be revived. Or let step away from the new job. It doesn't mean your career can't be revived when it rests into the black water, because you only have you only have so many hands. You only have so much energy. Um, in the midst of such a, a devastating loss. Yes. So she's thinking about cutting them loose. Maybe I could just untie the knots and just let go of that book project, let go of the new job, let, let go of some of the things maybe I've started nine months ago that seemed really wonderful at the time. And the knots of, of feeling. Mm hmm Knotted up feelings and yeah. that there's a choking on. Thank you for sending us this dream. Thank you for trusting us with it. Yeah. I hope we have been able to spark something in you that resonates and offers you something on your on your way forward. Indeed. Thanks for listening. To submit a dream, suggest an episode topic, or join our mailing list, visit our website, thisunionlife.com. If you enjoyed this episode, give us five stars and a good review on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and make sure to click the notification bell to be alerted whenever we upload videos. And keep up with all things TJL by following us on Instagram, Facebook, X, and TikTok.